on a Wednesday night. Amazing. And I have to tell you that um, that was taken, that was a few weeks ago, and I was here a couple of Wednesday nights ago, and there was more than that. Yeah. The, the driveway that we get to go out was even full. So I had to go out way out on the grass and go out around to get into the entranceway. There's people, for you that have never been here, uh, I call it ca uh, controlled chaos, <laughs> because it looks chaotic, but it's very much directed by the Holy Spirit. We've seen people healed. We've seen small children give prophetic words to them. They don't know that this is, this is normal for them. So when we try to craft in and make them try to ha get into their mind a lot, then we shut them down. The last day your sons and your daughters will sit in church and observe what everybody else is doing. They'll prophesy. It's not a strange thing. But they're declaring the proceeding word and presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone asked me not too long ago I was at another church and I said, so you're in the food ministry? I said, no. I said, we're really not. We've done this 36 years from the very day one that I came to Tyler. And I said, we're not in the food ministry. We're in the kingdom of God ministry. Yes. We give out food, obviously. But when, if that's all you see and the objective is we lose sight of you feed your enemies, you feed those you do love, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And I think we're swirly really poised for what's get, going to happen here coming in to the last season of life, and we need to position ourselves in such a way. The good news is that we are out of money to buy food. The good news is we know where the money is. Amen. And I'm not even talking about all of you. For such a time as it's the kingdom of God. We have grants that may be coming. We don't reply on all that, but as you've taken, we've already given the opportunity of giving today. But just think about it. Uh, we used to take an offering once a, once a month for Love Indeed, and we bought food out of that. And we got a lot of favor. We're the largest food distributor. Uh, Frank, you can correct me if I'm not, up here in East Texas. People come from all over, not just in Tyler. And because of that, such favor is that we're given, have been given pallets and pallets of produce and other things that are perishable. Some of the things we have to buy, and so in fact I saw somewhere that this week was a, the, a peanut butter drive. Anybody see that? You bring a jar of peanut butter, and I thought, a jar? We got pallets, you know. We'll just bring pallets and win the contest. <clears throat> but anyway, after you bring it, then we pay for it to get it back. It works for handling fees. So anyway... We just want to hear the Lord and say, when you give to the poor, you lend to God. And we believe in that, stood on that firm for a long, long time. So something supernaturally is going to happen with that coming on. So anyway, happy to have for us our friends here. You know, I mean, remember Tracy Stewart. Tracy had been alive. <clears throat> her husband is with her, which confirms the things she's been saying. She does have one. <laughs> And so, James, we're happy to have him with us as well. We, we enjoy them. They're, they're our tribe. And then some friends, uh, Deanna, who's been watching online, she's been peeking through the window. We got her to come inside, and she, she's uh, from afar. That's, that's F-A-R, not a fire, like in Texas, far. That's a far over there, not F-I-R, F-A-R, just to clarify. And she w did live in Texas. She moved to uh, California to take care of her parents. And uh, we're believing, she's wanting to make plans anyway, moving back. She has two friends with her from Bastrop that I've known for years ago. And so we're happy that they're here. 
And a lot of people will be here tonight, and when they choose to have only one service at a time, they'll be here tonight for the ministry of that. So anyway, very thankful for to be home. I'm glad to be home. I enjoy being, not, uh, being home in my own bed and not living out of a suitcase for a while. And I'd rather be with you than anybody else because I know when I'm here I can be refreshed because I like to be among worshipers. What I want to share something with you this morning, I'll just tell you where I'm heading so that uh, you'll track me instead of me having a surprise ending. You know, you'll, be, you'll know it up front. <laughs> You've been around a while. I like a kicker. I like, I like the hook. But we've all heard that we only use 10% of our brain. I was challenged recently by the Holy Spirit and he said, if you only use 10% of your brain, he tells me things I know to go things to, towards I don't know, then how much of your spirit is not used? And we know that we're a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5. The Lord sanctify, set apart, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, your spirit, your soul, and your body. And we're in a time where people are so physically conscious about their body, how it looks, how it feels, and it's a perception that other people see them. And yet sometimes the very thing that gets the less attention is the th- part of us that's eternal. Ecclesiastes 3 said he puts eternity into the heart of man. When he said we were created in the image of God, the word is very close to teslem, which is the thoughts of God, or imagination, or thoughts are very similar. Vibration, if you would, the thoughts, the sounds of the Lord. God placed something inside of us that is him, that is eternal. It's not talking about we look like him, obviously. He would have a great sense of humor if that was the case. But he's put something inside of us that relates and connects with him. God is a spirit. He doesn't have a brain. He doesn't have a vocal cord. But we know that sent out from us is the vibration, frequency, whatever term you want to use. When God spoke over creation, rakaf is the word, that literally means to inseminate or vibrate, if you will. I was years ago sharing down a a conference in Houston And a man that was a doctor down there uh, was in the conference. He said, and I was heading up to Bastrop, by the way. And he said, can I ride up there with you? Because he was going to be at that same place in Bastrop. And I said, sure. Didn't know who he was. And he was a medical uh, ER doctor. He said, I heard you talk about creation. The voice of the Lord sounds the Lord. There's a sound in the blood. And so in the voice of the Lord is in the blood. Your blood is told, Genesis 4, from about Cain, your voice cries, sound cries out from the earth. And I said, sure. He said, can I tell you something medically? And I think that most of us here adult, we can understand that. He said, the physiology of a woman, we talk, we can say the bride, is that when she hears something that resonates love and peace, security, that literally what causes there to be procreation the egg is that the begin the fallopian tubes begin to vibrate to release the egg hearing a sound releases the ability for the word and the 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 sperm of god which is the word when it touches that egg we know there's a spark of light or life in him was light and his life was the light so in the same way that when you and i come encounter with the sound of the presence of God, our innermost being, that part that's relayed that God gave us that's eternal, begins to vibrate. That doesn't mean that you feel it. You know, how many of you feel like I'm vibrating right now? That may be a buzz. I don't know if that's the same thing. People pay money to get buzzed, which is a bad thing. But be filled with the Spirit, not to the excess like booze, wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You don't be buzzed. Feel the vibration of the Spirit of God. The only thing you think of is what it feels like for these other, this heathen out there to get drunk and do all that. But he said there's a side of you that God wants you to be so filled with him that there's a vibration sign. When the earth was without form, darkness on the face of the uh, deep, the Spirit of the Lord hovers, broods the word, begins to inseminate. When we were born again, there was an insemination by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I'll get into that in just a moment. But there was an expectation that when 
we receive the Lord as Savior, Lord and Savior, I want to suggest to you that the end goal was not just to get us out of here and get us to heaven. Otherwise, once you're saved, you're out of here. Don't marry anybody that's saved if you want to be with them very long because they're going to leave you. We're up and out of here. But the idea was there was an expectation because the word born again comes from the, the idea of ganeo, G-A-N-A-O, which literally means that we get the word genetics from. We have been born again or have new genetics or new DNA. Inside of every DNA, we understand that there is a code for the potential of what we'll grow up into be like. Look at the parents, you can see this, what they're going to grow up like. In the same way that when we're born again, there is a spiritual DNA. That's when we are called sons of God. Now, I know that there's an Elohim of that hub thing, but we are the weos, the sons of God. And in that, he's put inside of us a code, if you can handle that word. Not new agey, but just simply he's put inside of us a potential of what we can be. First John even says, we don't know what we're going to be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Remember that? One idea of the fact is that not only is that in future tense, and the idea when he comes back in the clouds, we're going to see him and we go up and we're changed on the twinkling of an eye. But it's also the idea of present tense. As we see him, have revelation of right now, so we become like him. We grow into the very thing, the potential that he's called us into being. Now my question to us is the fact is, when you were born again, is your spirit so alive that you already know your spirit already knows everything you need to know about God. I think so. I think so. But the problem is to get it from my spirit being through my mind. So Kikos, mind, will, and intellect. Paul talks a lot about the carnal mind as enmity, resistance towards God. And we know that we do have the potentiality that we have the mind, we can have the mind of Christ. I'll explain it like this. A few weeks ago, Diane, well, it happened for more than one, one time. Diane said to me, he said, I think I need a new computer. I said, oh, it's okay, because I know she didn't do a lot of, you know, she didn't do any gaming or anything like that. <laughs> and so uh, I said, well, I think your computer's fine. And so she knows it's not working right. I can't email, so it's not going out and all that. So finally I looked at it and I said, yeah, I may have a few problems. And I took it to the geek squad. And we know who the geek squad are. Guys with t-shirts that don't match and everything, you know, that means you're a computer expert of them. Got holes in it, then you're really, you're really a, a tech person. And so in the process of that, they took it in, opened the computer up right then, and they said, I'll tell you what your problem is. I said, you haven't even really looked at it. I haven't even told you what it is. Right here, I'm pulling up the diagnostic. This thing's a dinosaur. I was glad Diane went in there, so she said, I told you so. <laughs> but she, she, she knew. And I said, well, it's not that old. I said, look right here, you can still put a CD disc or DVD disc right inside of it. Is that bad? Well, yeah. If you can stick something DVD bigger than a USB in it, it's pretty old. <laughs> so you need a new computer. I said, can you fix it? Why would you want to? If I fixed it, it would just still be a dinosaur with a new look. <laughs> so this is what he said. I pulled it up and he showed me there. She still has over a gig. I mean, knows what a gig is. It's not when you go out and play music somewhere, but <clears throat> could be. She still had a gig of memory left on the computer. I said, it's still good. She said, but just because you have a gig, he did, just because you have a gig of memory there, it doesn't do you any good if you can't process it. You can't get it from the hard drive onto the, on your laptop, the screen, desktop. It may be in there, but you can't get it out. It doesn't do any good. It's like you've got a book sitting on the shelf and I've got everything written right there. I've got all the everything I need knows right there, but I can't read it. So then I began to realize our spirit, when we're born again, there's place inside of us of eternity and understanding 
of the might and the purposes of God, the understanding of God. In fact, Jesus told his disciples that it's for you to know the mysteries, bathos is the word, that which you can't see with natural understanding. Bathos of God, that same thing we said, launch out in the deep, that's bathos. You can't go somewhere if you're trying to figure it out with your natural mind. So when we try to understand it, and I'm not saying you've got to check your mind at the door, but the Bible does give us a lot of information, Romans 12 too, primarily, be transformed, not just simply by setting and listening to other preachers. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word there is ananeas, which means an upward move towards something that's never been. Nuos, ne, new. So when the Lord talks about renewing your mind, it's not taking an old computer and just uh, shining it up a little bit. When we're born again, there is something in our spirit that's alive and stamped on the inside of us is the DNA of the Spirit of God and says, this is what you can be. This is the real you. Everything that's seen on the outside, you're more than a bag of bones. With what's seen on the outside, I gave you there so everybody else could see you. But really what I'm looking at in 1 Samuel 17, when Samuel is anointing David, sees all of his brothers, all the sons of Jesse, and, and he looks at him. He said, none of these are them. I look at the heart. So when God is deep, getting ready to do something, he starts from the inside out. He starts operating in something that's deeper than what we know. We're looking to fix circumstantial stuff around us, and God's looking at doing something inside. Even in our nation, God's doing something inside, more than what you see externally. Yes. Yeah. Sure. The bowls are filled up, obviously. The narrative is, we're going to do this and all that. You cannot legislate behavior, only ch behavior changes when the heart is changed. Yeah. Jeremiah says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to write my word, fleshly tables of your heart, which means your mind. I'm going to give you understanding of how to bring up all that I said by the Spirit of the Lord that was given to you in the very beginning of time, and how to bring it up and say, this is who you are. This is the real you. No wonder the devil fights so much to redefine who we are. Do not let people define who you are. Don't let them stick a note on you and say you never could be this, you couldn't be this, you couldn't be that, you could be this, you couldn't be that. I go all the time, Tracy does too, where, where someone's always trying to define who you are. Give you a prophetic word, you're now this. Well, I was that last week, now I'm this. God keeps schizophrenia, just moving all over the place. I don't pay too much attention to that because not a matter what people say that I am, when Jesus looked at Peter and he said, who do you say that I am? When Jesus said, when Peter announced to him, Matthew 16, thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God, flesh and blood, you didn't get this intellectually, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. It's all about a wedding. It's all about a wedding one day came to reveal the Father. So much in that. When Jesus announced back to him, you're a Petra, Petros, whatever terms, what verb you want to use. You're a piece or pebble, rock, chip off the rock. And he's saying to them, and then he says to him, I give you the keys of the kingdom of God. If you've ever heard a lot of people preach, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. They use the term keys as Clytus, K-L-E-I-D-S, I-S, and the word Clytus there doesn't mean this thing necessarily that uh, I've had people demonstrate this, the keys, I got the keys, not your car keys. Well, let's just say it's, you know, the keys of the kingdom had. But the word Clytus means to be shapened and sharpened and cut to, to be united with the lock. He doesn't change the lock, he cuts and shar sharpens the key to fit the lock. So he's talking about beware be of the unity of the spirit, not the uniformity of church or the culture or who it might be, but I've come to cut you as a key to fit into the kingdom of God, not to let kingdom of God try to fit who you think it is. I give you the right, when you are shapen, when you're cut and you've ever had keys, you know how to be cut, the, little, the nuances and all this, delicacies, then it's actually the unity of the shape. If we want to put it down to that word. Easier word. 
the unity cladis. I give you the shaping and sharpening, the cutting to fit in the kingdom of God. Then you know the kingdom of God is at hand. It's in your hand. And all you, have, you can unlock the kingdom of God. When you try to unlock something that you've never had revelation about who he is. And he's the king of the kingdom. Then the fact is you get really frustrated trying to unlock something that you don't even have the key to. And he is the door. You can't unlock something without having him be the one to start working on the key cut. All right. One last illustration and then I'm done. I'm really after this whole idea. Greater is he that's within me, First John, than he that's in the world. He, not me, greater is he, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, said in John 14, all of John 14, 15, 16, all through there, the time will come when he'll no longer be with you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's no longer just going to be with you as an Pericletos advocate, but now he shall be in you. In Acts chapter 2, he moved from the outside to the inside. Wherever he's working at, that will cause change. He's not working just on the outside, he's working on the inside. Because the inside will affect the outside. Amen. So when we're looking at God, bring, bring me into a place where I can use more of my brain than 10%, but allow my spirit to come into the... My introductions are long. The rest of it's short. Here's my, here's my notes right here. So, Well, that's really good. Well, not so much. When I don't have, when I don't have many notes, I mean I have to go longer to figure it out myself. <laughs> so just don't let it fool you. When, when you have a, a newborn baby, that thing is so cute. Inside that baby is the DNA of the sum total of you, mama, daddy, there. You look at that baby and he starts pooping. You have to clean up messes. You have to feed them. Late night feedings. And all of a sudden your, your idea of this sweet little thing has changed. And you start thinking, is this the rest of my life? Is this what I've got to go through? That baby has a potential. It is destined for something that's awesome. Destined for something great. It is being shaped and sharpened. And you get to be part of the process of the culture and environment that you put him into. To bring him to the full potential. According to Isaiah 46 and about verse 3 to 10 in there. God knows the end from the beginning. So he already knows the potential of that. I use the word potential. It's also the way we potency from. Genesis talks about the life or the potency is in the seed. And yet when the seed is planted there, the potential is coming, coming together. So the potential that's in our spirit is much bigger than what we've allowed it to. But fear, worry, unbelief, doubt, circumstantial, complaining, all of those suppresses no matter how strong of, of uh, your spirit, no matter what's inside of you, can never get out because of my mind creating a di di diminishing the spirit of Christ who's in me. If he's greater as he that's within me than he that's in the world, then I've got to let God arise and let him scatter the rest of it. So I want to talk about a little bit how do we, how do we allow our spiritual being to, to crop up from that. And I know that we can sit and count, do counseling forever and ever, and I'm fine with that. But sometimes we do a lot of appealing to the mind and suppresses the spirit. There's some things that God just wants to, he wants to have first touch on, first access to. Jesus told Mary, you can't touch me because I'm going to the Father. He was already lit up, lightified, but he went to the Father, took the blood in the Holy of Holies on the, on the mercy seat there. And the father, according to Jewish custom and law, with the wave offering, the harvest couldn't begin, nothing could begin until that the high priest went in and blessed the field and then it could begin to come. Jesus was saying, it was during barley season when he was, when he was crucified, resurrected. This is my sense of it. He said, my father gets the first touch. I want to release your spiritual intuitive, your spirit. This is what I believe he's saying. By allowing him to have the first touch. 
we have gone into a marketing of thing in the in church world. You can go to conferences for everything to learn how to become wealthy, to learn how to be impoverished. One extreme or the other. If you if you can pay the fee, you can pay the dime, they'll tell you whatever. But there's some things, the Spirit of God Himself, I want to be the one to cut the key. So it's going to unlock that. So you know that you didn't do it on your own ability. You didn't do it because a certain group that you were, you were attached to or aligned with. You were aligned to the best key cutter in the world. Doesn't even fit at all. But he, Jesus said, I give you the keys. I'm in charge of the key cutting. Amen. And I'm the one inside of you. And I have a Holy Spirit coming along that's going to reveal the Father. So that baby comes to the full potential and some of you are now here because you made it through the infant stage. But it's possible for your person to be born again 50 years and still a baby. Boy, that was worth two amens. I I normally say I'll fly out tomorrow and be out here. No, no, I live here. I have to stay here with you. (laughs) But if we're looking for God to get the biggest bang for the buck and all that you want to do I have to realize there's more going on inside of me than a psychological mumbo jumbo or even a higher high intelligence I can know a lot about the word of God and still not have allowed my spirit to come alive when they were with Jesus they didn't know he was here on the road to Mass we didn't know who he was but oh didn't our hearts burn within us it wasn't oh man our minds were just so challenged by that and there's people that do that. But he's wanting to, to ignite, to come into an encounter. That's what the word encounter means, to a sound or voice that passes through into our spirit so that we can become fully released into the DNA process of God. So if you're one that is around you where you have to change diapers for a 50-year-old, you know, I mean, not physically, hopefully that's not happening. <laughs> But spiritually, he wants us to grow up into the fullness of what he's called us to do. All right. Turn with me to John, the third chapter. And as always, I'm going to have to run with it. I'll just quote some things and then I think I've said enough. The foundation, you either turned it off or you're intrigued, one or the other. Pick it up in John 3, verse 3. Familiar to us should be. Jesus answered them, and he's, he's speaking to Nicodemus, actually. Nicodemus recognizes he's a rabbi, and re- Jesus recognized that he's even a teacher. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, Ganeo, genet- a different genetic, not his physical, but his spirit being, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When you're born again, you ought to be able to see the kingdom of God. He's talking about their eyes. I don't think so. Ephesians 1.18 Paul is praying this apostolic prayer. I pray that the eyes of the understanding would be able to be enlightened to know the hope of your calling. The word enlightened there, biazo, literally means uh, the eye do to, to not only imagine but it's to be able to see by the spirit. Also if you went in Matthew 11, Jesus is saying something in, in there, and talking about John the Baptist, it's the word Beazza, the violent is the word, is Beazza means to crowd out. I, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless the king comes in and crowds out everything else Amen. that is not of him. He, come, he comes to take over. All right. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Here's the natural thinking, trying to understand the spiritual understanding. Now that I'm old, how can I be born again? Can I enter a second time in my mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, he's talking natural things, Jesus talking supernatural things, and so they're not connected. But Jesus is putting it out there prophetically to be able to see beyond the circumstances where you are. To move from the natural understanding of our previous experience in life to something that is still moving forward, renewed ana, neos, upward and new, different complete, you haven't been there before unless one is built into the water and of the spirit 
natural and spiritual, he cannot even enter the kingdom of God. John came preaching about the kingdom, but Jesus said, one who enters the kingdom of God is greater than John, even though Jesus had said how great John is. So it's better not just to preach about it, but to enter into it. We can preach about a lot of things, but until we enter into it is his goal. It's not just our goal to get born again, which is great in the beginning of that, but to bring us as sons and daughters into the kingdom of God, that we grow up into the full expectation of his DNA and of what he expects over us. As a parent, when you have that baby, there's an expectation that you have for that child. You don't expect them all their life to stay in, you know, toddling and stay in diapers and get drinking milk. That's why I think after a while we get tired of it, God allows it so we won't keep them there. We expect you to move beyond that. Even Hebrews 6 talks about, here's the basic fundamental principles and we're going to move on. And he says in Hebrews 5, said, milk is desired by, by those of the young ones, babies, but those who are ready for meat are a full age. So he said, then repent from dead works. Those things that don't work. All right. Verse 5. Jesus surely said, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. It cannot be one thing transferred to the other. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We use the word metamorphosis. Transform by the ruining and renewing your mind. You know the story of the caterpillar and the butterfly? That's how the best, easiest way to do. A butterfly will never again be a caterpillar. But there's an understanding and creation that this caterpillar must come out of this to become its destined as a butterfly. You can't go back, but he continually moves us forward, you know, to become what he's called us to be. Uh, verse 12. I have told you earthly things, and you didn't believe me. But how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In other words, Jesus' really desire is, I don't want to just talk to you about earthly stuff. The common denominator, how to live life out. And there's a lot of places and a lot of things we can do, just how to manage your life. How to be happy and how to be peaceful and how to, you know, keep, hold wealth and know all those. And those are things have a place in time. But unless we get down to the innermost being, inside of our, our hearts to where the transformation comes in, to come to the full potential. And out of that, there becomes a, a peaceful understanding lifestyle that happens. That you're better as a husband and wife, the more that your spirit is allowed to dictate what your mind is thinking. My point is this, that your spirit can think, not just your mind. What is the spirit saying to the churches. I know that's talking about Holy Spirit. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. He's also speaking in us and through us to that. Now, look with me. Ephesians the fourth chapter. I'm not going to get into FIFO. But I want to read the context of that. Ephesians 4. Ephesians um, Verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. He's talking about gifts to the church for the equipping. He's a real good, strong word there. Equipping, resetting bones, restructuring, putting into place for the strengthening of the saints for the work of ministry. Ministry is not standing behind the pulpit. It's for the work of serving. For the idea of revealing who the Father is and revealing his heart. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen my Father. If you've seen me, told Philip this, you've seen my father. So the ministry isn't something you do to get a check for. The ministry is who you are because you've been born of the spirit. And what flows out of you is this expression of this is what my father's like. All right. Pick up verse uh, 10, 13. It's given us these ministries till we all come to the unity of the faith, not the unity of mind, the unity of doctrine, which it could be. Unity of faith. It's the faith of the Son of God. Galatians talks about the unity of the faith of the Son of God. So the unity of faith is just not our doctrine belief, but it's the unity of the faith of the Son of God who died for us. All right, look at this. And 
to become the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect teleos, a complete, finished person. It's not perfect meaning without flaws. It means that you fulfill the potential and after this potential comes to the surface, then there's things circumstantially all on the outward that begins to be tweaked and understood. But first of all, if fear is still operating in my life, my spirit who has no understanding of fear means that I am not fully come to the full stature of life. If you're sitting around the table, something comes up immediately, oh, I don't know what we're going to do now. Here we go again. Always happens to me. I, I'm so unlucky. Lucky. That means your spirit has not been allowed to communicate to your mind because your mind would say, God's got this. Greater is he that's within me. So you can kind of measure how mature we are, and I'm using that word, not chronological age, but mature in releasing the potential inside of you. All right, moving on. Here's a kicker. Verse 15, verse 14 rather. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every, every wind of doctrine. And I mean, we're seeing that. You know, the latest thing is that Kamala Harris is the Antichrist. Well, first of all, the Bible says that Antichrist is a man. And it's not even coming from the U.S. And I so mean to read your Bible because it has nothing to do with her. Now, she may be of another spirit, but not, she's not the Antichrist. She's not the, she doesn't have Christ, maybe. I don't know. I'm not making that judgment. And it's not about the U.S. and what's going on here. It's about another nation. So let's get real, folks. It's just another distraction that somebody throws out there. Oh, yeah, that feels good. That feels right. It's not biblical. All right. So maybe, maybe you believe that. Just believe whatever you want to. It says the man of perdition, not the woman. Unless she's had a gender change. And I may, that may happen. I don't know. I don't think so. I could give some other reasons for it. But anyway, suffice it. That's not the message this morning. <laughs> All right. Um, verse 15. Every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That may be what you thought. Plotting. But speaking the truth, aletheia, manifested reality, the way God sees something. Truth is not information. Truth is the person of the Holy Spirit. Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ. So the very thing that he said your spirit was destined to was to grow up and into the headship where he's the headship over your spirit being. Not where you just kind of decide who you are and what you are. He's the headship of that. Let me just take just a minute here to kind of tweak this verse out. Speaking the truth in love. How many's ever had someone to you? Don't raise your hand because you may be, uh, it's not a trick question. You've had someone come to you and said, brother, I just need to speak the truth in love. And that is a way, just button up, buddy, because they're fixing to give it to you between the eyes. And the truth as they see it is something that, it's informed, that they see by their own opinion. But if you read the context of scripture, the one who is speaking truth is the one who grows. Not the one who's getting it put to them, but the one who's speaking truth. You want me to say that again? Someone comes to you and tries to tell you, I need to speak the truth in love. You can go ahead and give me your opinion or your mind. That's fine, or maybe not fine. But it doesn't mean that you're doing it by the auspices of the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. And the one who is speaking truth out of their own spirit, and it's done by in, in the whole context of love, the spirit of prophecy is testimony of Jesus, who God is love. Then at that moment, then it causes us to grow. But it doesn't have to be about speaking the truth over someone else. Speak the truth over yourself so you can grow in yourself. What do you say to yourself? Diane loves this verse of scripture in Romans 8. If God be for us, who can be against us? Most people stop that. And the next part of that same verse says, and what will we say to these things? What are we going to say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So there's times that we need to be able to speak the truth to ourselves that causes us to grow. One of the things that causes us to grow spiritually, our spirit is alive there, but my mind needs to be submitted and come under that, is to speak truth and truth. Aletheia is the manifested reality the way God sees, by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
God would never by the Holy Spirit come to you and said, you know, I don't like that outfit you're, work, you're wearing. I just love you. I'm speaking the truth. No, you're not. You're not even speaking tongues. You're speaking forky tongues. Who cares what you think about the outfit? You just, you just gave me your age right then. I, like, I don't like that outfit you're wearing. Well, okay, baby, grow up. Don't get caught up in things that have no value or purpose and does not bring people into an edification, exhortation, comfort. So when we're speaking the truth, it causes our mind to be subjected to our spirit that Christ lives in. The Holy Spirit will come along and help us with everything that Jesus said to us and about us. So he's saying, I want your spirit not to grow up and know more things. It already does. But your mind to be able to process your hard drive, your spirit, to bring it into the reality of that when you say, devil, get behind me, your mind's not going, I hope this works. But your spirit comes so much alive and your mind said, this is the will in Christ Jesus concerning me. Get behind me, Satan. You have no place in my life. That begins to move, the point is, that you're no longer wishful thinking to where you're declaring what your spirit knows very well. So when you're believing and praying for something, pray out of your spirit being and not over your mind. Because there's things that your mind will talk you out of that God said, it's in the word. Jesus' disciples got amnesia a lot. We're going to get in the ship, we're going to go to the other side. Storm comes up. Do you care that we perish? Do you remember what I just said? Your spirit says no, but your mind takes over because it's based on everything that you see outwardly and manifest. So one of the signs of maturity is that you're not moved by what you see in the natural or the external, but you allow the Spirit of the Lord to speak to you truth and saying this is not what you think. One of the signs of maturity is how that uh, you handle t critical times in life. Immaturity says, I'm going to be offended. Your spirit cannot be offended, only your mind can. <laughs> I just got offended at that. It's because your, your mind is in charge and enlarged. But your spirit says, what's that got to do with anything? You belong to Jesus you are his, so you're seeing it from your mind's vantage point as a carnal flesh of insecurity instead of saying, I know the end of this, and God's going to be glorified. He's going to see more than what I'm seeing with that. I was sharing the story in Ohio last week, I said before, Diane has a way of seeing things that are not there. Count those things are not as though they are. I'm trying to explain to her natural things and she's trying to invoke spiritual things. Because I thought it was my job as the man to explain mechanical things of which I don't know a whole lot of, but anyway, it makes me look manly. <laughs> we had a Cadillac, an old car, and, and uh, it just quit running. It was in the garage. Wouldn't start. Called a mechanic out. He says, it's a computer module, it's a part of the ignition, and it's just not going to, you can't do it, it's got to be replaced. It's $500 just for the module. I said, man, I don't have $500. It's when $500 was really $500. Still a pretty good chunk of change. And so I, I told Diane, I said, it needs a module. No, it needs, it needs Jesus. I said, baby, you don't understand God created mechanical things and so fit that. She said, well, when we dedicated this car to the Lord, we said it belongs to him and he keeps up everything that he owns. Amen. The problem is you've taken ownership of it. And when you take ownership, you've got to keep it up. When we take ownership of our family, and I understand there are kids and we have an accountability there, then what happens when it all falls apart, we try to find a way to fix it. Instead of going unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith, so the unity of the faith and the Son of God. I have to keep unity of his faith, not the unity of what I'm thinking. So we're still in the garage, and so uh, Diane just spreads herself over the hood of that car and said, we're praying. And I'm still thinking, 
I know what the module looks like. <laughs> in my mind's eye, back to that word in 1 Corinthians 18, is the word photizo, not biazo, photizo. Biazo is Matthew 11. Photizo, which means take a picture. My mind took a picture instead of my, pic my spirit taking a picture. Your spirit will take the picture of what God says. Your mind will take a picture based on your experiences. And we say experience is the best teacher. Is it? It can talk us out of. It can push us out of. It can remove all the things that God wants to do because we know more. So you know the end of the story. She's there praying, God, you own this car. It belongs to you. It, we don't have the $500. You do. So in Jesus' name, thank you for fixing it. And she stepped back and she said, now start it. Well, in those days you had to have a key for that. So I put the key in and I said, I'm going to have to show her. It wasn't my faith. I'm going to have to show her that don't be disappointed when God doesn't do it. Took, turn the key and run. Thing took off and run. My eyes were this big and she trying to walk in the house. My work here is done. So when we see with the mind, we make judgments based upon perception and we miss out what God has in store for this. What looks like it could be a miracle in the middle of crisis, we're telling God about the crisis when he's trying to explain to us about the miracle. Feed this group. There's 5,000 here. So explain, you know, they're trying to figure out, I've never seen 5,000. My experience has said what five loaves and three fishes, you know, would do. Their experience is understanding that, said, Lord, there's not enough here. You need to release them. Now they're telling him what to do. Your mind will start telling the Lord how it should be done. And when we do, we diminish our spirit from what he would do. Yes. Yes. The kingdom is at hand. Well, my experience is it. I'm in control with that. And he says, you feed them. I'm sure at this point they were thinking, no, we don't have another out. Let's prove to him, this is my thinking, let's prove to Jesus that it doesn't always work the way he says. So they took it, he blessed it. When the Lord blesses it and he's declaring and speaking truth over the bread and fishes, then it cuts off what we've said about bread and fish. And they began to give it out and there was just none left over. I've seen that. I saw that in Cuba. Dip in the pot. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Still there. And I know how many parts of it there are in a chicken. And they pulled five or six legs out of that pot. Because I brought the chicken. It was alive. It had two legs and I was holding on to both of them. Squawking all the way. But when you bless something from the perspective of how God sees it, instead of blessing something, Lord, thank you for this food for not making me sick. This is how we bless it in Western world. We bless the food. May it be good for my stomach. May it be nutritious. But in those third world countries, they're blessing it for God to multiply it. Yeah. I wondered how come we see more healings, at least I have, my brother travels a lot more in, the, in, the, in Africa and Pakistan. That there's hardly ever a Christian that there's not a hundred plus people that get blind eyes open and deaf ears open. Those two things. Because in, the, in America, our Western mentality is we process things based upon I can do things myself. Where you're in a country that has not access to a lot of these things. You don't have access. I'm thankful for it. I'm not diminishing that at all. We tend to have our own way of how we think it should be done. When these people are simply saying, God, it's either you or nothing. You or nothing. And their eyes are open, their ears here, and they simply believe. Because they've kept unity with faith, not the unity with what the culture is saying. Here's my point. If revival, restoration, renewal, whatever you want to call it in the United States happens, then we have to be able to allow our spirit to come to enlarge the capacity more than our mind because every time there's a move of God or something happened in our nation, our mind kicks in and we want to control it. We want to market it. We want to write books on it. We want to tell God how to do it and it just kills it all. 
We want to touch the ark and sturdy that thing, all with good intentions, all good mindset. And when we do, somebody dies out of it. And we lose the ark and it goes away. We lose the presence of God. And then we just talk about it historically. How would it be to have such the mind of Christ in such a way that nobody cared who got credit for it, that the fear of God was on us, the awe of God was on us in such a way that it was simply as your spirit now becomes the new wineskin. Instead of the new wineskin coming a new church growth model, my goodness, how does that fit into scripture? We got a new wineskin. No, you just get, a, get another bookkeeper, you'll be fine. The new wineskin he's talking about because you don't need a new wineskin if you don't have any wine. You'll catch that in just a minute. Why have a new wineskin when you don't have any new wine? And the whole point of the wine will change your palate. One taste will change your palate so you're ready for what you're getting ready to eat. Instead of reminding God about the old revivals and all that. Your spirit is crying out. Let me out. Let me out. I can see the solution. Well, we, we need to talk this thing through. Let's have a committee. Let's, let's vote on this. And let's just talk about how this thing can work out. When the mind of man, I'm not saying that there's not some great wisdom. But the wisdom of God is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, your spirit operates in such a way. The awe of God, he's bigger. He knows more. There is a supernatural proceeding from the Spirit of God. <laughs> Somebody move that clock on me. Spirit of God that transcends what we can ask or think. Ephesians 3, 20. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. As soon as I could think it, he's moved on beyond that. There is this releasing of the glory of God that's not going to come because we have some cute messages. We have connections. We know this one, that one. And we put up, you know, something special that happens from the Spirit of God inside out. When we come to the full stature, the full nature, the word stature, the Ikea, not Ikea, that's another place. Ikea simply means the potential of the fullness, potential of fullness, Hikea. In other words, to come for the full stature, the potential of what he really set for us. So in our spirit, there's a picture of what God's calling us into to be. But all I can see and talk about is what I don't have, what I don't see, and the criticism of everything else, and this should have been that way and all that. Then we diminish our spirit because our mind wants to be in charge. Still with me? Yeah. All right. Let me know a couple of verses of scripture. I, I think I'm done. There's always another week. Um, look at verse 23. You put off the you put off concerning your former co- conduct behavior the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind the spirit of your mind needs to be removed verse 27 give, give no place to the devil topos don't give the devil any room devil always tracks in lies he always trades a, a lie for the truth whatever truth you have you have to exchange the truth for that lie whatever the Holy Spirit said to you he wants you to give that up so you can believe a lie Buy the truth and not sell it. So the, the Lord is really wanting to bring us into a revelation where we're not having to worry about how's this going to happen? It's going to happen by the Spirit of God. All right. Put up, if you would, those. I want to give you five signs of a mature person. And then I'm done. Yep. Five signs of that mature person. All right, I'm glad I brought my own copy and see them. Number one, you can measure the stature of where you are. 
How well do you react under pressure? James 1, 2 through 4. These are all pretty weak, by the way. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various testings or trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, your testing your faith brings stuff to the surface. It's a test. It's an only test. Don't give the devil, devil the ground. It's the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect, complete, full work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The things we go through are to, re, to diminish the mind, to cause the mind to be subjected to the greater authority, which is our spirit man. When you die, your spirit is going to have an eternal, eternity with God. So people say, when I get up there, I'm going to talk to Moses. And man, what were you thinking of? And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to David. How What was stupid was you doing out there? You should have went to war instead of looking at Bathsheba. Your spirit is not going to be up there to, just to communicate with history. Your spirit is going to have a hunger looking for the lamb, the light of the world. Because in him, you're going to know everything. You don't have to worry about whether there's ice cream in heaven. <laughs> Don't follow that stuff. If you need to find out if there's green grass or ice cream in heaven, then man, elevate, lift yourself. Lift, you know, let your affections be lifted to the hill which comes your health. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is about a wedding. Where's my ice cream? Where's my ice cream? I don't, I don't think there's a place, but if there's a kindergarten in heaven, maybe they just need to send you back there. I don't think there is. Because when you come into that, the things that you've known, you're going to know. And we're going to be surprised at some of the foolishness that was distraction. Yeah. And people will go to conferences and pay money. Man, I'm doing the wrong gig, I guess. To say that kind of stuff. Because if the truth does not stir inside of them and something so superficial does that means that the mind, will and intellect is more uh, going after the carnality than our spirit that cries out for him I'm crying out for him that's why most of you would be here because you're looking for the presence of God looking for something more I, we hear it all the time, new members class I'm looking for something more I'm not sure what more equates to everybody but I believe it's more of the presence of God and less of, you know, man manufactured stuff, the layout of seeing thing that's lukewarm. And I'm looking for a church that's balanced. I understand balance means the spirit, but to where balance for some churches mean the fact is I need to have an agreement with the world and still keep some doctrine. I'll just set up front here. Abortion is the spirit of Molech for killing babies. And anyone that agrees with that or votes for it, not we politically, you vote for that, it means that I'm in agreement according to Romans 1. And if I'm in agreement with I'm held in the same part and parcel with it. So therefore, he said, I've called you out. Out of what? Darkness. Which means a culture that blinds their eyes. The, the, word, the God of this world had blinded their eyes, a little g. And the word blindness there was the hadas, which means blind the light. Take, you, take your light with the light. And now we're operating after the, what everybody else is saying instead of saying, what is the Spirit of God saying? We'll give an account for that. Well, I just think it's, you know, it's nobody's business. Well, between them and God, I understand. Between God and us, too, is how do you think about it? Peter, who do you say that I am? What do you think? Peter, what you think really has an effect. And what you say has an effect. I just don't want to be involved. Tag, you're it. If you're in this world and you're breathing back and forth, then the fact is I don't want to let the devil think I'm in agreement with one th I'm not talking about political stuff, about economy and all that. We have our own opinion. But when it comes to things that are so in the word of God, we should say, I stand with you, the word. He sent his word. And so I stand with that point. Rise up. All right. Oh, we're, in, we're number one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> number two. I told you I'd go fast and I didn't. Sorry. How you treat others. This is really basic. So how you treat others. You can be around and how they treat one another speaks of what's going on on the inside. How you deal with outward things speaks of what's going on the inside. 
I've been in places, been in green rooms, people that were sweet and kind then walk right out and start shouting, you know, go over here, go over here, and lets me know, man, you don't, you love the ministry more than you love the people. Yes. When you die, there's, there's no ministry in heaven. There's no preaching in heaven. <laughs> there's some people will hate that, but there's no preaching in heaven. The Word, the Lamb of God, the Word is there. I don't have to preach it, I mean seeing it. If you really fulfill the royal law, James 2 8, fulfill the royal law according to scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor's not the guy on next door, it's those who contact or in proximity to you. Number three, mature believer has control over his mouth. <clears throat> James 3 and verse 2. I didn't say I was perfect, I just, you know. There's a hundred of these, I'll give you five. A mature believer has control over his mouth, James 3, 2. We all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect, complete, perfect man also is able to bridle his own, his whole body. In other words, how we say even affects our whole body. Can't say something that is off the rails and just out there because I got a right to my opinion without it affecting even your own body. The power of life and death, light and darkness is in our mouth. What releases your spirit by agreeing with his word or what can condemn it and suppress your spirit is by what we say as well. And I'm not talking about God so that I've got to be so right on every little nuance. But we understand our, of our spirit. The sons of thunder think, God, let's just call fire down on right now. I've been in Dallas traffic. <laughs> where I thought, God, if you and I have any kind of relationship, can I one time, I'll not ask you for another thing, one time, that guy in front of me, can I call fire down? Just to melt his tires, not kill him. <laughs> but it comes back to, you do not know what spirit you're of. Right. I've learned more in traffic than I have. I mean, I had a whole book come out of it. On traffic. All right. Control your mouth. It means that you've controlled a lot there. All right, number four. Mature believer is a peacemaker. Sometimes people do not want you to be a peacemaker. They'll say, you're making peace at any price. I'm talking about the peace of God. I'm talking about the Prince of Peace, not the fact of just an issue. When we operate in the peace of God, rules, the Bible said. When you come into a place, if it's worthy, or in other words, the presence of God is there, let your peace come upon it. In other words, you, you carry the peacemaker inside of you, so you can allow peace inside of you to come on it. So how, how we do that, practically, is that I'm not going inside criticizing, looking at everything wrong with that, but I'm really to release his heart in the matter, and so the presence of God comes in and deals with it. You're a peacemaker. One of the attributes of maturity is not how long you've been saved or how much how many Bible verses you remembered. I mean, because I had a promise box that my mother pulled a, one out every day, like fortune cookies, and you know we had to call it, name it, and remember it by the time school was over. But it's interesting how many times during the day I, I'm glad I had that verse. I used it on a few people. I didn't say I had the right spirit, I just knew how to, I just used it. <laughs> Mature mind is a generous, number five, we'll move on. Peacemakers were called the, the sons of God, we also is the word there, just meaning of family. The family of God are peacemakers. If someone just doesn't want to make peace, and I'm, I'm, I'm not through with there. If someone doesn't want to make peace and they just keep hammering that, I got to get this off my chest. Well, there, you shouldn't be carrying something in your chest because that's not the Spirit of God. And I'm all for talking something through in the right spirit, but not a right fighter. I fight for the idea of being right. Jesus always dealt with the religious sect that way. They were more interested in the scribes having it all out 
to the letter and dot and tittle and all that when Jesus told them, you don't, you know what you're, you read, you search the scripture daily, they speak of me, but you wouldn't come to me. In other words, you're more interested in the nuances than the relationship that comes by being with them. Okay, number five, I'm done with that one. All right, number five, this is final it. Final offer. A mature mind is a generous heart. You can tell your maturity by generosity. If you're always looking about seeing what you can withhold, that means you're not generous. I'm not saying taken advantage of by any sense, but looking how little instead of saying, what can I do? Because I'm revealing the heart of the Lord. I mean, we have lots of visitors, a lot of examples of people that have been affected that. Here's one of my favorites that relate to that, not just talking about money and the reason I've chosen it for that purpose. The generous soul, Proverbs 11, 25, the generous soul will be made rich. The word rich there doesn't mean money, but it means inf have influence. You can have influence by the Spirit of God, not control and power that comes with mammon. And mammon is not just money. Mammon is the spirit that would use money as a pry bar against others. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. When you're generous, loving people, giving a word in due season, become platters of gold, they're right. Let's see the other part. Apples of gold, thank you for the mouthing. Look at Trish and mouth. Apples of gold and platters of silver. I was just testing, you were right. When we do something like that, it is generous. Didn't withhold doing good when it's your power to do it. It's generous. If you give mercy and receive mercy, you're generous. But if you go away with the thinking and thought is, I wouldn't do it that way. I'd do it this way. Then your mind is, may, you may be smart in this world in terms of mechanical stuff. But all the time is, your spirit is groaning. Last week or when I was here last. Two rails on a renewed mind. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And the word there is just a word picture is don't be like, don't treat him like a jilted lover. Grieve meaning hurt and pain. And you go back and look at it, it's like a jilted lover. I've, I've agreed to it. We're going to be married. We're doing all these things. And then something took me away. And now I'm going off something else. That's a jilted lover or grieving the Holy Spirit. The second rel is quench not the spirit. Quench means to suppress, extinguish, don't let him have its full course or position. And so with that, it's just put to, to put out. When you walk in those two rails, then the Holy Spirit can speak through you there. All right, stand with me. Five minutes ago, it was just five after. Somebody snuck back through and did something to that. I don't know. Father, we just ask you the sincerity of our heart and our spirit that you would mature our spirit. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, that just didn't mean around the edges, in Christ, in the anointed one. He's a new creation. Not just talking about physically. He is a created being that has allowed the potentiality, the naos of God to come to the surface. If you're praying for the Lord to change you and do something, we all the cry of our heart, Lord, change me. But when change starts happening, we tend to resist it. It's like detoxing. We're great in asking for it, but it's not too fun when you go through it. You've heard me say we pray big prayers and we give God teacups to put it in. So the capacity of our spirit to receive something that's beyond what we could ask or think, that means our, our spirit man has to be more in charge than our mind will allow it to be. You have the 
anointing of the Holy Spirit inside of you that will keep you from going into error just for the sake of doing something silly and different. You don't have to worry about that. You got to be attentive. But at the same time, don't be so cynical, so angry, and so afraid that I'm going to get into the wrong side that I end up doing nothing. Matthew 25 with the parable of the talents. The one who hid it said, I know who you are. I know about you. No, he didn't. Because he knew that his whole point of giving you something is to invest it. Everything God created was the idea it would would grow, procreate, increase to come to its potential in the knowledge of the Son of God. You cannot stay where you are. You'll either become angry, frustrated, disappointed because continually when the Holy Spirit starts tugging on your heart, it gets uncomfortable and you find that you know really quick then you start being, finding all kinds of reason to run from Him. They ran from the presence of God. They used to run to the presence of God. You can tell the proximity, am I moving towards the tree of life or I'm running away from the tree of life? In Jesus' name. I want the ministry team come to come. I just feel the challenging of the Holy Spirit in my own life as well. God, I don't want to have a 100% spirit and yet so little I'm using of that. You said all things are possible to them that believe. And my mind has trouble kicking in at times. Help my unbelief. There's times that you'll literally have to say to your mind, you're not in charge. You're not in charge. Especially when it starts trying to talk you out of doing something that will glorify the Lord. And there's times you cannot process it with your mind to make sense. If I stopped and tried to figure out why would that happen or how this thing, two plus two does not equal four in the kingdom of God. He brings you into a place where he says, if you'll trust me, I'll do exceeding things that you don't even know about. Your eye hasn't seen it. Your ears not heard about it. You haven't captured it yet, but it's there inside of you. Come and let's, let's go on this journey. Come walk in this journey. We're going to worship the Lord abandonedly. We're going to worship the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and strength. Can you lay down all of this stuff? But God, but God, what about this? What about that? When I came to the city, I had to lay so much down. I thought, God, it's not fair. I think you're being unfair to me. And when I looked back, and I thought, man, it had no value at all. Because I could not see what was ahead of me. I only felt what I was giving up behind me. So you can really feel the tug and the pull of the Holy Spirit when He starts moving you to the unselfishness. And some of you really need the freedom from selfishness. You need to get free from being, what about me? What about me? What about me? What about you? It's all about Him. And He will come in and He will make all things new and then He becomes 